Hello everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Uh, we begin our webinar in the Leo Solar Festival. My name is Alexander Ilchuk and I represent the Coordination Group of 2025 Initiative. And before we start our webinar, we have a short alignment. Let's visualize the planet, cover it with the lights, of people of, of goodwill, linked together in the network of light. We see people joining our webinar from around the world, coming together in a circle, connecting with love and light. We link in the group heart center. the group heart center we connect with the hierarchy and the heart center of the hierarchy the Christ We see the triangle of Shambhala, hierarchy, humanity, with energy circulating within the triangle. We bring our focus to humanity and its need. We come together for the service to humanity. Before we proceed to the webinar, um, on behalf of the coordination group of the 2025 initiative, I want to read a statement on the current world situation. We feel that there is a need to bring the group focus on the thought form of solution. The 2025 initiative acknowledges the recent acceleration of the global crisis that humanity is experiencing. 
we realize the need to strengthen the focus of the ageless wisdom community worldwide by empowering the thought forms of constructive solutions to the world crisis. It is the responsibility of all disciples and aspirants around the world to maintain and communicate the vision for humanity, providing it as the beacon of hope within the fox and maya, glamour and delusion surrounding the world. In our perception, the nature of the current crisis from the esoteric perspective can be described as follows. 1. Humanity as a whole is undergoing the process of the first initiation, which in a general way could be described as the shift of focus from the principles of egoistic selfishness, solar plexus consciousness, to the principle of the common good, heart consciousness. 2. The passage through the gate of initiation is preceded with the walk through the burning ground, a struggle on all the planes for individuals, communities, nations, and humanity as a whole. In this process, we as humanity are faced with age-old accumulated problems and are expected to take responsibility for the needed transformation. Whatever we are experiencing now is not the end of the world. It is a process of purification and maturing. 3. We are witnessing the unfolding and anchoring of the shambolic impact of 2000, which brought the extremely powerful energy of will directly into humanity. Many people witness now electricity in the air. It provokes harsh actions, yet gives strength to those who become focal points for the distribution of this energy. Referring to the wisdom of the spiritual guides of humanity, we can clearly state that the solution for the current crisis is defined by three major factors. Establishing the right measure of peace, implementing the principle of sharing in economic affairs, cleaning the house in religious and political affairs. Ongoing persistence and endurance in daily efforts are essential qualities all disciples must develop. This will bring us desired results and will help humanity to overcome the current crisis. We as students of the ageless wisdom can recognize the seeds of the new civilization sprouting up in all fields of human endeavor. A future civilization based on right human relationships and the principle of the common good. It is our responsibility to empower this vision and whenever possible to emphasize and support the emergent forms that manifest this vision. The vision of the new civilization should be communicated with strength and clarity by students of the ageless wisdom. The thought form of solutions to the current world crisis should be continually held in the light of the meditation of all trained occultists. The sons of men are one, and I am one with them. I seek to love, not hate. I seek to serve and not exact due service. I seek to heal, not hurt. Let pain bring you reward of light and love. Let the soul control the outer form and life and all events, and bring the to light the love that underlies the happenings of the time. Let vision come and insight. Let the future stand revealed. Let inner union demonstrate and our cleverages begun. Let love prevail. Let all men love. Oh. 
Thank you very much. And now I'm honored to present our guests today. Um, representing Lucy's Trust Headquarters Group, Dominic Dibble from uh, London, Lawrence Newey from London, and Mins van der Velt from Geneva. And this is the part two of uh, the Electric Universe webinar, which uh, we had in Gemini uh, last year. So I'm really grateful for you for uh, to ag agreeing to continue this work and being with us together. Thank you. So the floor is yours, and please. Okay, it's uh, Lawrence here, and um, well, do we know anything about water? <laughs> Maybe the, um, the way to start this would be to give a, uh, just um, its connection with uh, um, parted forms in uh, the unfolding sort of electric universe story, and, um, and then move on from there. Um, I think what's coming to light uh, is the fact that uh, water is uh, being discovered to have structure, and that structure is electrically induced. And it, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as we as we go on. But uh, what has been discovered through uh, a fourth stage, uh, fourth state of water. Is that water surfaces are around its periphery with uh, hydrophilic surfaces, uh, which are surfaces that like water. Um, that um, a structured form of water starts to form. It's uh, electrically structured and it has many very interesting properties, most of which, from our point of view, the esoteric point of view, is that it's likely to carry information. Uh, that links up very well with the memory of water, of uh, what's been released in experiments, and also with the work of Bruce Lipton, um, how he uh, describes the fact that uh, the real information of the form is not on the inside of the cell, but it's on the outside. Whereas, as esotericists, we look for the real individuality, the centers of consciousness at the heart of the uh, organism, the, ch the chakras. The information about the form is on the outside of it. For us, it's in the etheric body, and as we'll explore later, the ether is in fact a form of water in its highest state. So that's my opening shot. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking from my perspective, this is Dominic speaking from London. Um, I think Lawrence has given us a very He's given us the helicopter view, as they say at the uh, management speak. He's given, he's, he's kind of given us the big picture there, and um, I think what I'm going to do, having been a scientist myself in a former incarnation, um, is I'm going to zoom in, zoom in a little, um, and I wonder, Sasha, could you pass me? the screen so I can start showing one or two PowerPointy things. Thank yes. you. Okay. Um, I, I assume everyone can see my screen now. Can, can you confirm that, Sasha? Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. We can see it. Yes. Okay. 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 Um, I'm going to start with a very simple illustration of, of why water is electrical. Um, and this is quite interesting, just from a, from a pure symbolic um, thing, uh, sense, which is that uh, Water, as we all know, every, everyone knows the formula for water. It's practically, it's probably the, the only chemical formula, which is what it is, that everybody knows. It's like E equals mc squared, isn't it? 
it's H2O. Everyone knows it's H2, two hydrogens, one oxygen. And if we're thinking about it from an esoteric point of view, you know, it, the significance of a chemical, uh, a compound, a molecule made from um, hydrogen and oxygen is is, is massive because, of course, hydrogen is the fundamental, the, the protyl, the you know, the the beginning of everything. It's <laughs> it's it's like it's 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 the mother of all form, if you like. And oxygen, and it's also it's the most abundant element in the universe. Um, and oxygen is the third most abundant element of the universe. And so what you've got, a hydrogen, a hydrogen usually hangs around as, as H2, so it's, it's two hydrogen atoms. And oxygen is O2. And there, those, um, I'm going to be a little bit technical here, so those are both linear molecules, and they're, 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 they're neutral, there's no electrical charge in them. The chemistry, the realm of chemistry, which is where I, I did a bit of studying, it's all about electrons, it's all about electricity, the distribution of electrical charge and what you get when you combine um, hydrogen and oxygen is you get two molecules which are not polarized, they bind together and boom, you suddenly get this molecule H2O which is very polarized, all the, the, the electrons prefer to hang out on the oxygen and that means that the hydrogen, the two <coughs> hydrogen atoms become sort of positive and you can see that in that structure, that little delta means a little delta minus means there's a little negative charge on the oxygen and delta plus um, means that there's a positive charge on the hydrogen. Um, so you've got polarization, and as we also know from an esoteric point of view, polarization, the ability to polarize one's consciousness is extremely significant and you know it's, it's a part of the task of discipleship to be able to uh, successively polarize in higher and higher states. So you've already got very deep symbolism going on with just this simple molecule. Um, it's also triangular as well, <laughs> which is again deeply symbolic. Um, and as you can see, well, th what this polarization does, even even just in very very simple basic chemical terms, is that it creates these strange bonds called hydrogen bonds. Those little dotted bonds which are there, um, which. Already, we're starting starting to show you that what was a very very simple molecule is starting to structure itself in quite non-simple ways, quite complicated ways, and we're, we'll talk a bit more about how that structuring uh, takes place in, in various different contexts. Um, but um, the other thing that about that's interesting about the fact that water is electrically polarized, as I pointed out, it means that it's very, very good at in, inviting other molecules to participate in reactions. And if you think about it, if you did any chemistry at school, practically all of the chemistry you did was in solution in water. It was all done, practically all of it was done in water. So again, it's it's a kind of, it's a medium which it permits um, interplay. So I think I'll probably wind up when I'm, that's my my opening shot and uh, I'll, I'll maybe let Mincer say something now. I think I've probably spoke, spoken for long enough. And if Minson wants okay. to shift, shift to his his presentation, yes. I will shift. I will shift to that. Okay. Can you uh, can you hear me? 
Yes. All right. Can you just go to the um, the EZ zone? My name is Mince, by the way, and I'm talking from Geneva headquarters. Uh, what I want to to point out, yes. Okay. Right. Um, what you <clears throat> what I want to point out is that usually we think of water like something quite uninteresting. Uh, as Dominic already said, we see it at H2O, which all of us know from a chemical point of view. But we are more and more realizing that it's not so much the chemical structure of water which is important, but the the structural, the, the form and the structure of the molecules inside water, which is much more important. What has been rediscovered recently, because it is already known for several decades, but it has completely been ignored by mainstream, is that if you look at water at the surface, which you see here in a, in a gel uh, in the picture, uh, water is on the sides of the cell, and you can see what is called here EXCL, which means exclusion zone, and you see the dimension of it. What is happening in that surface zone? What you see is that there are no, no um, what, they, what you see on the side of this image are what they call solutes, which is just some name of little particles which have been put into the water and they are expelled from the surface. Now this is something which happens in, in almost all situations of water at the surface and it has been completely ignored, but it is very important to realize because for one, it extends about 200 micrometers, which is about a million or several million layers of molecules. And, and that's the most important thing, it is electrically charged. Now, people have studied these surfaces a little bit more in detail. And if you go to the, the other slide, Dominic, with the hexagon, Yep. There you see again what Dominic already pointed out, the, the, the molecules of water, and I will spare all the, the mathematical details, but if you simply count the positive and the negative charges when oxygen, which is are the red blobs, together with hydrogen, which are the blue blobs, if you simply do the counting uh, when they are structured in a hexagon, you will see that each hexagon has a net charge of minus one. So even though the whole water in itself is of course neutral, when we get this hexagon structure at the surface, it builds up an electric charge, a net electric effective charge of minus one. What has also been detected in these uh, um, uh, uh, exclusion zones, again on the surface of the water, is that these layers stack uh, one above each other. They are slightly displaced to get the, the, all the structures right, but these are just details. What we see is these hexagonal structures in, in millions of layers, one above each other, building up a charge. Now, from physics, and I'm not a chemist, but I'm a physicist, if you have a, a, a charge uh, over a uh, ex certain extension, you do need energy to maintain that charge. And the, the current idea is where does that energy come from? It does come from uh, the radiation, mostly radiation of the sun. It could be infrared radiation. But we do, to, to make this happen, and again, this happens all the time, even though we never realized it, and it could have its origins, or at least its relation to what scientists believe would be the origin of life, physical life here on the planet. Scientists tr always try to figure out how that came about. These kind of phenomena, electricity and water in this kind of structure, may play a very important role um, in that uh, subject. This is the second part of um, a seminar. The first part was on, a, on the electric universe, where we stressed electricity to be all around in the big picture, in the sky, in the heavens, in the stars, the galaxies, etc. 
where we try to explain that there electricity plays a, a major role. Here we are zooming in on very little structures and surfaces of water are in for example in, in human bodies, in, in animals, in plants where you have the water which is rising up. There is a lot of uh, water but not in the state of bulk water which you would have in, in a glass or something like that. But if you look at it um, inside a cell or inside a human body you have many cells which are surrounded by water which means that that water is on the surface of the cell and that's exactly the state which we which we are describing here so again if we if we zoom down to um, to the level of the cells and uh, Lawrence already talked about Bruce Lipton who is also talking about the what they call epi, um, epigenesis um, that is exactly happening at surfaces of cells which means surfaces with water which is in this um, e uh, exclusion zone. Uh, Dominic already has put another slide which shows you again the surface of water. You see at the left the uh, surface, you see the exclusion zone which is basically negative and at the right you see the positive uh, ions which are called positrons. All this again is maintained by light by sunlight or infrared light if the sun wouldn't be there but there's always infrared light even though we don't realize it even the earth is emitting infrared right, uh, light. Um, I think this for a first start from my side so the exclusion zones are all over the place and they are playing a major role in all kinds of cellular processes even though in in the current biology books uh, nothing is written about it today. I think to put the importance of all this into context is to remember that um, what is it approximately two-thirds of the human body is water um, but because water molecules are so small uh, in actual fact they actually make it 99% of the human body. So you've got the uh, body of water basically, 99%. And although it was known that the surfaces of water did have this uh, very small charged area of a couple of layers, um, this exclusion zone is uh, actually millions of layers. Um, it's, in, it's incredible, it goes into infinity really. Um, the properties then, um, because as uh, Mincer is uh, explaining in this easy zone, you know, the exclusion zone, the um, water molecules tend to take on the shape of uh, hexagons, of the hexagonal structure in layered sheets. And each sheet can move. Uh, 60 degrees um, so to maintain um, electrostatic uh, sticking if you like uh, to form this tight lattice so as these layers build up the angle shifts slightly each time and the end product that you get up uh, that you end up with is a helix so that's obviously a very interesting uh, from the point of view of the um, Ray, the building ray of the system, blood wisdom, which uh, builds in uh, helical forms, but also when you uh, consider the DNA uh, of the body, the code of the body, uh, rather than looking for the uh, information solely in the DNA, we can go back a step now and think of the structured water that can easily enclose the DNA or the fibrous proteins, the RNA, and so you've got a garment of water surrounding all the DNA in the human body. That provides a perfect interface, not just for the energy of light that comes in and energizes it, uh, but also for information uh, coming from 
the third body, I would suggest. And what's uh, extremely interesting amongst all the properties of the um, of this exclusion zone of water is that it absorbs light at 270 nanometers, which is ultraviolet. So here we have an electrical uh, structure uh, which is uh, semi-crystalline, it's a liquid crystal, it's charged, the molecules are aligned, um, they have a structure that keeps the uh, charges apart, they're likely to carry information, and just through a precipitation phase we can imagine the energies of the etheric body precipitating through the violet ray and uh, ultraviolet into the uh, easy zone layer of water that surrounds the DNA. So that's exciting from the electric bridge point of view because we actually now have a bridge between solid hard science and the uh, more conjectural science from a, a strictly scientific point of view of the uh, body of ether. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, Dominic, can you please just could you please uh, put on that image of uh, DNA and the water tubes? Well, you want to go to that now? Okay, sure. Yes. Here we go. There we go. Well, that might be a good opportunity, as Dom, as uh, Lawrence was talking about DNA and the water, and also the helix structure of water. Um, this is an experiment done by Luc Montagnier, a, viro a viro virologist, sorry, and it, he has uh, earned the Nobel Prize in 2008 for his um, work on the HIV. <clears throat> Now he has done other experiments, and one of the experiments he has recently done. No, the other one, please. Yeah, yeah, sorry. I yes. Just, I was okay. Just, I was thanks. Just adjusting it. All right. That's it. So what he did is he he took two tubes, one tube <coughs> with water and a DNA sample in it, and Lauren has already told told you that on the surface of the of the uh, DNA we have this this structured water and then in another tube there was pure water. <clears throat> now please note that Luc Montagnier was a Nobel Prize winner. He was working at the um, Institut Pasteur in Paris so he's not an amateur and he has taken all precautions necessary to make this a real scientific experiment. What he then did is he has exposed the two tubes, which you see in the second image, number two, he has exposed the two tubes uh, uh, by uh, elect electromagnetic energy, which is radiation. He t he's done that for a while, I think about an hour or so, and then he separated the two tubes, and in image three, you see that he has put the second tube into a, be a beaker, and then he added uh, the raw uh, uh, components which potentially can create DNA. So chemically he has put in the, the, the molecules which would create a new DNA. And in number four you see the result and to, to his great surprise the resulting DNA has the same signature, the same structure, not all but parts of the DNA have the same structure, the same signature of the original DNA. So even though that DNA has not been in what we would call direct physical contact with the first DNA, the, the new DNA which is created in the, se the second tube of pure water has the same signature. Now this is a very interesting point for which there is no real physical explanation yet but it is clear that a, a key role is played by, again, water and we suppose uh, uh, structured water. Now why don't you know, or why don't you hear very much of this? All the, even though Montagnier is a Nobel Prize winner, most of this research is completely ignored and um, in his one of his latest uh, videos on YouTube, he, he, he told that he is continuing his research, but he has great difficulties to get uh, financing for this kind of, of research. So, 
I think I think it's it's interesting just purely uh, from the esoteric point of view. That's is Mr. Montagnesi French? Can you hear me, Mensa? Uh, yes, he is French. He was from Institut. Yes, I'm there. He uh, was from Institut Pasteur in Paris. And of course, look, Ben Vista was French as well, wasn't he? Yes, the French are quite strong. They have the fifth ray. <laughs> exactly. Are... <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting that they're, 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 this is an example of two French scientists using the fifth ray to, well, to try and build a bridge. And Absolutely. It's effectively trying to build a bridge between the, the well, the, the outer and the inner realms. Okay, do, I'm, I'm, I'm quite curious about this. Uh, this what do you, does, do you know, um, Mensa? What what led him to even do this experiment? Why why did he even where where did he get the idea for doing it? What why what where did it come from? Oh, I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> no. I wonder if the, is this is this maybe a good time to to maybe take one or two questions, Sasha? Do you think um, we've covered quite quite a lot of ground quite rapidly? I think, and it yes. might be a good a good time to just kind of. And I think uh, not, not just the questions, but to open the floor for uh, comments and ideas, and to have yes, it more as an open discussion. So, sure, if sure. anyone wants to contribute or to ask something. Uh, Please uh, use the function of raise your hand. It's on the control panel, and we will un I will unmute you because for technical reasons er all attendees are muted now. Or alternatively, you can write in the uh, question section, and there uh, I will read it. But preferably would be to hear your voice. So we meanwhile we can continue. It's it's very interesting what you're sharing, really. Uh, I, I'm just noticing on the attendees list. There's there's a couple of people who've got little question marks beside them. Is that uh, is that this the, this raising your hand thing you're talking about? No, those those were like uh, technical comments during the, the your presentation. People were asking questions, so those those are not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, well, while, while everyone's pondering some really juicy comments or questions or <clears throat> observations. Um, another thing I'd like to share, well, we've talked quite a lot about this uh, structured water which takes place at um, surfaces. And earlier I was talking about how the, the polarization of water um, creates this, starts to create this complicated interaction among the molecules. And in fact, even in the bulk water, i.e. away from surfaces, well away from the surfaces, right in the middle, if you like, of the beaker, nowhere near any surfaces, you, you also start to see quite complex structures emerging as well. Um, and um, so I'll just show you just there's a scientist again. This is a this is pure science. This is not um, this is not uh, somebody just making this up in their in their back garden or in their garage. This is a, a well-respected water scientist who, in fact, works in a university in London. And his hypothesis. Um, which has been, you know, there's there's there's, there's a, a reasonable um, experimental evidence for it as well, is that water molecules actually form into these very complex structures, which you can see here. I think I think you can probably see these are quite complicated structures, um, which have got icosahedral symmetry, which the icosahedron. Probably some of you who are familiar with um, sacred geometry will know it's it's the most um, symmetrical physical object it's possible to have. The most symmetrical polyhedron it's possible to have. It's got 31 axes of symmetry, um, and 
yeah, I just think that there's something very significant there. It shows you that <clears throat> just even from these, just these, this simple polarization, you're getting these very, very complex interactions, creating these very. It has to be said, you know, it's not as if these things are sitting there, uh, uh, you know, and it's staying there for very long. They're very dynamic structures which are constantly forming and reforming. But it shows you that the, the very simple molecule, only three atoms in it, and you get these incredibly complicated, beautiful geometric structures emerging. And I, I, I'm not aware of, um, it, it, it also emphasizes, you know, you think of water as being very simple. And like I say, just going back to my own chemical background, we never really talked about why we did all our chemistry in water? We didn't. Nobody talked about it. it was like you know, it just it was, it was in the background. Uh, but it, it just shows that it's it's so fundamental and so um, so basic to all life, at least biological life as we understand it. That uh, there's something there's something very significant there. Mm -hmm. um, there are two questions. Um, uh, first from Catherine Swenson. Uh, what kind of electromagnetic energy was used, uh, I guess, that experiment that uh, Mintz was sharing? And how would you relate this to esoteric understanding of energy bodies? I think it, yes, I think it was a radiation of about uh, 200 nanometers, but I'm not sure about that. I have to, would have to check it. What it means to energy bodies, well, I th personally, I think that we are, but not only in this example, but in many other examples, science is gradually approaching what we would call the etheric levels and the etheric bodies. And of course, um, if you would, um, as we would do, start from the etheric, then it is not too difficult to explain these kind of things. But the amazing thing is that now, um, r well, real uh, rational scientists are coming to really very surprising conclusions because in a way uh, we have all, all uh, seen the experiments of uh, Emoto where the term, the memory of water came uh, comes from. In a way you see here that Mem uh, water um, transfers in a way uh, a, a kind of memory because the, the signal of the first DNA is transferred to the second one. I'm not sure whether that uh, gives a, a full answer to the question. To put this into um, an esoteric context, um, just to explain a little bit more um, addressing that question, what's the relation between water and the energy bodies? Well, the first subtle body we're aware of is the etheric body, and so let's just deal with ether in general, whether we're talking about the cosmic ether or just the physical, uh, the higher four level and strata of the physical plane, that's ether. Um, well, ether is itself uh, constituted, at least according to the secret doctrine, of hydrogen and oxygen are in a much more subtle state, of course, and they actually form the interstellar ether. Hydrogen, of course, very inflammable, and oxygen, which produces combustion. They form water, which is one of the actual forms of primordial force or fire, the Vatsky says, but in a cold or latent fluidic form. So the actual water we see around us is, if you like, uh, condensed fluidic ether. Um, hydrogen is generally considered as the first born element, it's protire, um, and oxygen is what instills the fire of life into it and creates incubation. Um, so basically uh, we've got the four main substances of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen and carbon. Um, hydrogen burning in oxygen and being related uh, is the most stable of uh, to, to the principle of desire. It's, um, if you like, 
affiliated hydrogen with the astral body. Um, oxygen, the supporter of combustion, of hydrogen's combustion, is related to the principle of prana. Um, and we have nitrogen, which is an inert gas, and which makes up uh, so much of the interstellar medium and certainly of the atmosphere of the Earth. And that's uh, related to the etheric vehicle, which is basically inert, and uh, it provides the uh, area in which uh, desire and uh, the prana of oxygen can do their business. And then, of course, we have carbon, which is the fuel and the basis of all organic substances. Uh, related to the gross matter of the body. So throughout that, we've got uh, we've got the four elements, uh, the four basic elements that are related directly to the ether. Um, and one of the points is that uh, in our last uh, meeting, we have been on the electric bridge at all and had a look at uh, the electric currents of space. Um, it's well known that uh, space is actually formed of uh, a cellular structure as well. And uh, that was based on the work of uh, another Nobel laureate, uh, Hannes Alkian, a plasma physicist. And uh, he recognized that in the Earth's magnetosphere, that there's thin, stable current layers which separate regions of different uh, magnetization density from one another. And again, they form double layers around these cells of space. Um, uh, Band is between one and the other, and uh, they are an exclusion zone, if you like, another charged area around the cell of space where who knows what's going on in the, uh, in the vehicle of a, a solar or planetary logos. But it's all related, in actual fact. Uh, you can see the electric currents of space and uh, the way that electricity circles in space, uh, circulates in space, carrying being a lower reflection of the cosmic ether and how it in turn provides the interface between cosmic and the terrestrial ethers right down to the human etheric body. Thank you so much for that. We have another question uh, from our audience. Um, and this one is from Monica Adele. She's asking, could these findings in the long run give the evidence that man is an electric being? I think we already know that elect uh, man is an electric being. Um, that's well known the way the brain works, uh, the firing of the neurons. That, you, know, you can look in a uh, biological textbook and see how much uh, the uh, human body is made up of electrical signals. Uh, what's not realized so much is the idea of an electric cosmos, um, the extent of electricity surrounding us and the way that a human being interacts with that medium. Um, so that's what we need and why the electric universe idea is so fundamental um, to a better uh, understanding and bridge towards esotericism because once they establish the fact that there is electricity throughout a space um, which at the moment is uh, confined to the understanding of uh, a relatively small group of plasma physicists, when it's understood through an extension of the electromagnetic spectrum into areas that we haven't yet discovered. We can explain all sorts of things like astrology, telepathy and so on. So we will take the uh, mystery out of esotericism and it will become plain science of the future and then there will be other frontiers to investigate. I think also... Go on, Mentor, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, no, after, well after you, after if you take the, 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 all right, if you take the science of today, it is very segmented. There are no scientists who have a global view of the whole field of science. The chemist will look at the cell from a chemical point of view, and the biologist will look at it from a more physical point of view, 
Um, but if you look into the textbooks and especially if you just look at the drawings, you see all kinds of electric charges, but they don't name them, they just draw them in their, their, in their images and they continue either to see it from a chemical point of view or from a physical point of view, but in the end it is all about electricity. And I hope, and there are indications that this will come back, that eventually we will look at the same phenomena, but then used a, a terminology of electricity. There are actually very few, if there are at all, laboratories which do experiments with electricity. We have all kinds of experiments. We have here in Geneva, CERN, which is doing a lot of experiments with particles, but these particles are accelerated by electromagnetic fields. We seem to ignore that and we are more focused on the particles rather than on the, the electric <laughs> fields. But it is all about electricity. And I hope that in the not too far future, we will realize that we are really talking about electricity in all fields of science. I, I was simply going to add that uh, <clears throat> the fact that we are, <clears throat> there is so much water in our bodies and that this water is so electrically active and dynamic both at, at surfaces and in the bulk it just it does also make you wonder about the way in, in which our bodies react to or respond to all the different electromagnetic you know frequencies of electromagnetic radiation that are you know pouring through us all the time so it's it's just another thing to bear in mind that you know we are energy we are energy beings because we are electrically active because we're full of water which is electrically active mm -hmm. So it's just, you know, it's just it's just as simple as that, and you know any scientist can understand that. It's not really esoteric. Anyway, that's what, just yeah. But it, uh, what's interesting, uh, um, I think, is the symbology behind um, all this. Um, you know, it's, the, the evidence is mounting for the electrical state of the cosmos and the way that human beings can interact uh, in it, but as yet we still have a separative state of consciousness so we tend to think in terms as Minster was talking in terms of particles of division we've got to divide more and more and more find smaller and smaller bits until we find the answer to everything which of course we'll never, we'll never do we we'll just keep on dividing but when we start to unify and we look at the bigger picture it's only at that state when humanity starts to have a more inclusive Aquarian consciousness that I think that the idea of an electrical universe and the way that we're all linked together, no matter how much evidence there is prior to that, it's only when we are ready to understand unity and synthesis that we can possibly have a science of uh, unity through electricity. And um, that does mean um, which um, presumably a lot of you will know who looked at the electric bridge or electric universe hypothesis. It does away with Big Bang, the purposeless explosion, that, uh, that one big cosmic sneeze, um, the expansion of the universe, uh, which the Tibetan actually says in telepathy um, that we did in a steady state universe, it preserves a set form, which obviously makes sense. Uh, dark energy can go, dark matter, because that's all required to give gravity the power to fill in the missing part uh, of the universe, uh, what they don't understand uh, where the gravity comes from, to hold galaxies together. All these things, even down to the, uh, the, the, the royalty of Einstein's uh, relativity theories, uh, they are all part of the old stage of consciousness. And although it's developed the abstract uh, mind of, uh, of science and uh, an intelligence aspect, it's time now to move up to the more simplistic, synthesizing, Buddhic way of looking at things. And interestingly enough, electricity is on the Buddhic plane. It's uh, from there that, uh, it's in fact, the Buddhic plane is known as the plane of violet, and from there, as uh, the fourth plane of the system, it precipitates into the ethers uh, on the physical plane, the uh, whole body, and uh, that's a whole other area that can be looked at from the ultraviolet to uh, a therapeutic connection, again through the electrical medium. So 
you know, you see a lot of people uh, in esotericism trying to marry the latest thinking in quantum physics and uh, relativity and uh, multiverses together into the esoteric idea. But in actual fact, the simple electrical view of the universe is much, much better in it. Um, much more in harmony with the Tibetan's writings on cosmic electricity and bohats, uh, etc. Uh, Martin, uh, you unmuted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yes. Uh, hi, this is Martin. I just wanted to ask whether uh, uh, you all have heard of Marco Roden and his mathematics about electricity and the Roden coil, about vortex uh, energy. Uh, he's a mathematician, not a physicist or a chemist, but he's starting to put things together in a dramatic way, and you should know about him if you haven't checked him out. His name is Marco, M-A-R-K-O-R-O-D-I-N, and he's actually quite amazing. So I'm, I'm just recommending that you check him out if you don't know about it. Thanks. I, I haven't heard of him, so I'll, I'll certainly look at that one up. Me neither. I have a, me neither, <laughs> but it is a very good <laughs> idea to check him out. Yeah, he, just... he basically has created a, a non-resistant rodent coil with uh, two wires sending currents going in opposite directions, and he has the mathematical proofs that the, in between the two uh, fields there's a uh, kind of a phase field of, that's numerically uh, um, linked to the numbers 6 and 3 and 9, and there's a whole cycle that's tied, tied to the anagram. It's quite fantastic, so check it out if you want. Okay, I certainly will, because we have been looking for several minutes to this picture with all kinds of phenomena in the sky, and most of these phenomena have in common that they are about spirals. It's maybe not quite easy to see, but if you would be able to zoom in, they are all about helixes, spirals, and especially what is called in, in um, the electric universe terminology Birkeland cor currents, which is two intertwining uh, spirals together. And this seminar is about water, and I want just to give credit to uh, uh, a visionary and a researcher, not a scientist, but at least somebody with very good ideas of the last century, which is Victor Schauberger, if you would open up a book of Victor Schauberger, he is showing you water and the structures of water with ver vertices, all kinds of vortex phenomena, and you see exactly the same spirals like we see in the sky as Birkeland currents. So he, even though he didn't use the scientific terminology, he was studying water in an experimental way by just looking for hours to a river and for him, water was, as it is for us, a living entity. It is not, not just a Dutch chemical uh, component. It, it was a living entity um, with its connections, of course, to the etheric planes, which were essential for him. And one of the key, f the key features of uh, water is, uh, are, again, these spiral uh, structures uh, which are intertwined. Can I, uh, you've, you've just given me a, a lovely lead-in to something else about spirals. Um, the work that, we, that uh, um, Mensa was talking about, about uh, the exclusion zone, uh, was, has mainly been done by a gentleman called Gerald Pollock. As you can see, that's the chap on the right in the, in the picture on your screens. And there's another uh, scientist called Mei Wan Ho, um, who's done some very interesting work with water. Um, she wrote a book called Living Rainbow, uh, H2O, which is uh, it's one of these books that if you're a scientist, <laughs> it's simple, but if you're not a scientist, it's not really. I um, mean, I, I know I really struggle with it, and I, I've got a degree in chemistry. So, but one of the interesting things that uh, She's 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 quite interested in, in Pollock's work as well. There, uh, but one of the interesting things that she has um, drawn attention to is someone else's research. I can't remember who exactly, but um, um, you may be familiar with collagen. Collagen uh, is it's the main structural protein of the body. So it's everywhere in your body. There's 28 different types of it. 
you know, again, it's, it's, it's completely pervasive through your whole body. And these molecules, the, the collagen molecules are quite the big, they're triple helixes. Triple helixes, okay? So not just your double helix, it's triple helixes. And I've got a little picture here. Let me just see if I can find it. Uh, here we go. Yeah. This is not a very high resolution picture, but it gives you some idea. This is, this is, um, these triple helixes are arranged into what are called microfibrils, which are aggregated into fibrils, fibrils into fibers, fibers into sheets. So you've got your, you know, typical kind of fractal, fractal thing going on. And if you take a cross section of one of the fibrils, you see seven triple helices are arranged in a hex, in a, in a filled hexagon, you know, and you, <laughs> the numericals of symbology is almost, is almost too good to be true. So it probably isn't too good to be true, it's, it's there. Um, and one of the things which is apparently going on, or is suggested to be going on in these triple helices, is a form of um, conduction of electricity, which is not it's not the, it's not electrons which are passing uh, one way. It's it's um, H three O plus ions. Um, it's, it's protons, really. And you can one could go into a lot of complicated detail about you know each, it's not just H three O plus that goes up further than that. But leaving that aside, the, the idea is that you've got protons going in the, in the other direction. And one of the things that Mei and Ho has suggested is that there's an equivalence in some way between the acupuncture meridians and these proton conduction channels in collagen. And this is all happening again through helices. So, anyway, that's, that's why I wanted to say about that. <laughs> um, there is another question. Uh, f uh, uh, from uh, uh, Josette Lesieux, how could we imagine the consciousness that is present in water and its electrical organization? Is there the way to do that? That's a very good question, but the answer is not as simple as <laughs> I would say that the experiments are pointing more and more in in a direction where we approach consciousness. If you take the terminology of Rupert Sheldrake, he would be talking about morphological fields. Mm -hmm. If you take Bruce Lipton, he is talking about epigenetics. Genetics. Um, uh, Mei Wan Ho is talking about uh, quantum coherence, and these are all scientific um, terms which are difficult to define if you if you try to grasp them, grasp them with the rational mind but if you go a little bit beyond they are all talking about the same thing which we would call consciousness but don't forget for science consciousness is still an AP phenomenon of the brain whereas for us it is the other way around and I think the layer between the two is getting thinner and thinner and eventually that layer will disappear and then we are there that that will give the answer to the to the question of Lucette but now we are still the the, the, the barrier between the, the language of science and the language of what we would call esotericist that barriers is still a little bit too big I'm not sure I quite understood the question um... That's one way of looking at it. Was, uh, was it talking about how can we visualize the, the consciousness of water? Have I misunderstood that? Uh, that's my how understanding of the question. Water? Yes, yes. How we can imagine consciousness of water and how it can be contained in its electrical structure. I mean, to, to my mind, that's, uh, that's going to be different for each one of us uh, as well, looking in a different, uh, from a different perspective, it takes us into the uh, realm of divas and diva energy. Um, and I think that you know, just an exploration of cosmic fire that has to say about the water divas and how they work. Um, if you combine that 
um, with the electrical structure and that, you might uh, get some kind of uh, understanding, but there's always going to be the form consciousness of water that takes place in its various forms, and then when it's uh, used simply as a, as a medium through the expression of uh, a life that's embodying it, uh, there's all different ways of uh, looking at that. Interesting question. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I, I don't have anything really to add to that. Um, with, we are uh, running out of time very rapidly, and I think we can even, it feels like there much more can be said on this topic. Uh, probably we should move to our meditation. And hopefully we could have a uh, can, we could continue this conversation uh, at some later stage, <laughs> at part three, hopefully. It's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Dominic, would you please lead us into meditation? Okay. <clears throat> the full moon approach to the hierarchy, the sign of Leo, using the keynote, I am that, and that am I. Fusion. We affirm the fact of group fusion and integration within the heart center of the new group of world servers, mediating between hierarchy and humanity. I am one with my group brothers, and all that I have is theirs. May the love which is in my soul pour forth to them. May the strength which is in me lift and aid them. May the thoughts which my soul creates reach and encourage them. Alignment. We project a line of lighted energy towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet. And towards the Christ at the heart of hierarchy.
extend the line of light towards Shambhala, the center where the will of God is known. Higher interlude. Hold the contemplative mind open to the extraplanetary energies streaming into Shambhala and radiated through higher. Using the creative imagination, endeavor to see the three planetary centers, Shambhala, Hierarchy and Humanity, gradually coming into alignment and interplay.
reflect on the seed thought. I am that, and that am I. Precipitation, using the creative imagination, visualize the energies of light, love, and the will to good pouring throughout the planet, coming anchored on earth, prepared physical plane centers. Using the sixfold progression, Shambhala, hierarchy, Christ, the Yuga for World Service, men and women of goodwill, physical centers of distribution.
lower end to lead. Refocus the consciousness as a group in the periphery of the great ashram. Together we sound the affirmation. In the center of all love, I stand. From that center, I, the soul, will outward move. From that center, I, the one who serves, will work. May the love of the Divine Self be shed abroad in my heart, through my group, and throughout the world. Visualize the downpouring spiritual inflow released from Shambhala through the hierarchy, streaming into humanity through the prepared channel. Consider how these inpouring energies are establishing the pathway of light, the coming world teacher, the Christ. Distribution. As the great invocation is sounded, visualize the outpouring of light and love and power from the spiritual hierarchy through the five planetary inlets of London, Darjeeling, New York, Geneva, and Tokyo, irradiating the consciousness of the whole human race. From the point of light within the mind of God. Let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men. Let the plan of love and light work out, and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth.
Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Mintz. Thank you, everyone. This webinar was recorded and will be uh, in the archived section of our website, 2025initiative.org. And next month, we invite you to join our webinar, for the Burgess Solar Festival, uh, with Judy McAllister, representing Finhorn community from Scotland. The day will be announced Additionally, let's keep alignment and have a great work for the rest of this coming full month. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, Mains and Lawrence and Dominic. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you all too. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Lovely to share some time with you.